So, um, I don't know who rubbed this housing thing raw in the first place, but it turns out that housing is a huge issue on all kinds of fronts in Malawi County, right? There aren't enough houses for, for beginning workers, there aren't enough houses for uh, senior citizens that are, that are uh, convenient for them. Uh, the houses that we have are upper end and, and, and what, you know, we don't have houses in that market. Uh, I just talked to uh, oh, the mill in Willow to uh, David. David, and he said he could put 10 people to work tomorrow if he had the people and he had housing for them. Okay? So we have a little bit of a housing crisis going on. Kathleen, thank you for following up the first meeting and writing, I thought especially the piece on, uh, uh, on Randy Key, uh, Daryl was very interesting. Um, I want you to know again, uh, I'm not trying to run anything housing wise, okay? <laughs> Leave that there. I, as those of you who've known me for a few years know I'm kind of a provocateur, right? <laughs> so I like to get things stirred up when I see a community issue that's out there. I want us to start talking about it, okay? And so when we had that last meeting, there was some sense that low-income housing was not an issue, <clears throat> and subsidized housing, that the Christmans and Meridian were pretty well taking care of that. So I thought, well, I better call Community Connections. <laughs> I got you that. I said, who runs housing there? And she said, I do, <laughs> and I have for six years, and I said, that, uh, do we have enough low-income housing in town and subsidized housing? And she said, no. And not only that, she made me understand just briefly that it's more complicated than that. Um, we also, at that first meeting, and several of you were here, we talked about people living in, in uh, mobile homes and uh, up at the, you know, in the in RV parks. And by the way, I thought the RV park thing was good, but you need to do a follow-up on the people who are living there out of necessity rather than choice. You know, because that's a, and one of the things I've noticed, and I'd ask all the rest of you to notice, is how many people are using um, travel trailers and RVs as their extra bedroom, as the expansion of their house, or even in many cases in Joseph now, as their house on a lot purchased by a retiree, so the first five years that they own it, they've got, a, they've got an RV on um, So anyway, from this meeting is not going to solve the housing crisis. I don't know if we need a housing authority in the county. I don't even want to talk about all that. But I feel that we at the Josephi Center, since we're about uh, art and culture, and part of culture is how you live. <laughs> Uh, that we should, we will keep this housing thing going. And I do know that um, that Greg Hennis, who was here last time, is doing a workshop right now on timber frame housing. He believes that we can do small housing. I know that Greg, uh, that uh, Andy McKay and his brother are exploring small housing on a commercial scale. I know that Jim Zacharias is building these small buildings and is interested in small housing. So I promise you in the future that we will have a, a, a thing on small housing too. So Jeanette, what I would like you, from your perspective, and Ann Browder was going to be here too. Huh? Is anybody here from Seropimus? Sort of You, yeah. <laughs> I, one of the things with Seropimus is, uh, those of you, how many of you are really familiar with Seropimus? You go there on, see? That, you know, Seropimus is a portal for people moving to town, for people who just had a fire at their house and they, they're out of blankets and dishes, for people um, who are on marginal, you know, income-wise or, or just barely cutting it. So Seropimus uh, uh, is really, plus the people that just would rather buy vintage clothes <laughs> than brand new ones. But uh, I believe that, that Seropimus is really a portal to different income groups and different segments of our community too. And, uh, and Ann Browder was vociferous. And when I talked to her, she said, what do you mean there's enough of what would come out? There's not. We see them at Seropimus all the time. Okay. So 
With that introduction, Jeanette, if you could just give us, come from your perceptions of how many people are using, what, what are the bar barriers to people using subsidized housing? Is there enough subsidized housing? What are the barriers to using it? And what about that group of people who maybe don't qualify for Section 8 or whatever, but need housing, and how are they coping right now? Okay? Thank you. And thank you for letting me put you on the spot. Um, like Rich said, my name is Jeanette Hibbert. I work in Community Connection. I currently facilitate um, all the emergency housing programs that we have. Um, that includes more than just the housing program, also some of the eating programs, and then I can connect them with other resources that the Community Connection has, for example, transportation, uh, food bank. Currently, we are giving away school supplies to families that need that support. Um, I also sit on the, the drug court team um, with the circuit court, and so I'm able to also um, interact and support the folks that are going through that program. I've been there for six years, and um, the majority of what I see is um, people coming in who are on programs through the state or on Social Security. So their limit, their income is very fixed. Most of the people that also come through the program are going through what I have to call generational poverty. And um, so it's not it's not just something that they're, I mean, it's both, but um, it's a lifestyle, what they've grown up in. So making those changes to be able to to support themselves and the families, their, their families, there just are so many barriers. Um, so you're on a fixed income and you get on the waiting list for housing. Um, it's not an immediate fix. All the funds that we have are limited. Um, some of the programs that we have are anywhere between six months, one month, um, to two years. I help. The people that come into our office fill out applications, get on the waiting list through HUD. And HUD is different than Community Connection. Although we partner and we work together, um, it's two different funding pots, it's two different agencies. Um, I can make referrals, and some of the programs that we have that are called TBA and CFC, which is tenant case assistance assistance and continuum of care. Those programs are lengthy and what they are, and for the six month program, there's a, a different classes that we go through, there's case management that's involved, um, oftentimes they have to pay a portion of the rent, and then we would contact the landlords if they found a place to live, and um, then subsidize and facilitate that program. Who is responsible for HUD programs here? Then? Um, HUD, which is the Northeast Oregon Housing Authority. And they're in the grant? They're in the grant. Okay. Yeah. The waiting list for a house is anywhere between a year and two years, depending on funding and the waiting list. Um, a lot of times people in that program move multiple times, so unless they're aware of um, or connect with someone, that can tell them, make sure if you move or you change your address, you have to update that. If you've been on the waiting list for a year, year and they say, you know, we have you, we have a unit open for you, um, and they can't get a hold of you, then that's lost. And they move on to the next person. Um, yeah. How does it work as far as, like, I know somebody who applied for housing here in Joseph, when they lived in Georgia, and after like a year or so, they were accepted. So you can be out of the area and still be? So without knowing the particulars of that case, um, what I can say most likely happens is if you're on HUD for a year, um, you have to stay in that address, that unit for a year before you can apply to move to another place. And okay. that has to be a reason why. 
So they were most likely on HUD. And a lot of times, if HUD is in, say, Georgia and they transfer to Oregon, the dollar amount may be different. So if it's higher, then that takes out of um, what spaces or vouchers are available for Oregon, specifically Willow County or Union County. And so that's one of the reasons yeah. why I think um, they can never, when you call, you can never say, you don't really get a straight answer because there's so many different factors that are involved. So how many people in the law can we actually talk How many people can we That would be a question for us. I don't know. I don't know that answer. Um, but I can tell you like, what we're just saying. Subsidy come out of USDA? Yeah, that's my understanding. Wow. Well, there's more to learn, obviously, here. So if someone comes into my office and says that they need housing, I typically okay. do three things. I put them on the waiting list for any programs that I have. I help them fill out a HUD application, which is the Northeast Oregon Mountain Authority and the grant. And then I also give them the applications for Mountain Crest and um, sort of so, Kathleen, how, did you, how many people are in that, are on state subsidized housing in the county then? Did you get I did anything? not get that, no. Anybody else know? Do we know how many units there are? How many units the Christmas have? Probably about 40 or 50 here in the Enterprise. 40 or 50 in Enterprise? And then between uh, the two sections in Joseph, there might be must be forty or fifty apartments again. Then there's Are, also two in the Lowell, the Leisure Way, and the Leisure Way too. Okay. Leisure Way too. And are all of those apartments subsidized to some extent or another? They are. So nobody's playing full bear board in any of those eighty or hundred apartments. How about the, you can see a structure a few blocks behind Enterprise Electric, is that subsidized in some way? It's like a newer housing? Yeah. Yeah. And they, 
Christmas you've tablet. never Googled Viridian, they are huge. Yeah. Not just here in Milwaukee County. But the one by the fairgrounds, that's that's a little different. That's elderly and disabled. That okay. is elderly, elderly and disabled. And the difference that Mount Crest owns those apartments as well. Um, so they are not, if you don't have a voucher from HUD, meaning if you qualify, you've been on the waiting list, Based on your income, they'll subsidize X amount of dollars for your rent, and you pay X amount of dollars. Um, you pay full price until your name comes up on the list. Oh, you can get into it if they have an opening. If they have an opening, and pay full board and wait for the subsidy to come through. Yeah. So what generally is for a board, full board in that situation? tell me that we are already maxed out on um, the assisted. Okay. They're speaking specifically to the units who were in the section eight, and they're going by numbers based on our population. So we would have to say, well, yeah, but our population has this many numbers, not the numbers that it was originally based on, in order for, and, and I think they said the last time they'd done a study was 12 years ago. So the HUD allocation is based on our gross population figure? I don't know if the HUD allocation is. I know that the state. What the city and county are telling me is based on really old information. And they did a, I forget what it's called, but a housing um, study for the whole area. And according to the housing study, we have the right percentage of assisted. And assisted means you get a voucher. But that was 12 years ago? At least. Well, there's more than just the charge. You can get a voucher and then get a private residence. That yeah. 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 What Paul is referring to is, um, correct me if I'm saying something that is different. The HUD voucher is basically a ticket that says if you can find a house that's for rent within this amount, um, X amount of dollars, based on your household size and the number of bedrooms that you qualify for. Um, it does not have to be HUD owned or subsidized. You will subsidize it for you. <coughs> but there's a lot of paperwork required by the landlord, and a lot yeah. of them don't want to go through that. And well, some of them don't qualify. Some there's don't. not, well, Janet, as a, a owner, what is your input on that? Well, I manage a 24-unit apartment building, and we have, at this time, about five people who are getting assistance from Northeast Oregon Housing, anywhere from a small amount to full rent. And But I could take all if I wanted, but I don't. we don't happen to have more vacancies. But, but yes, it's our choice, and I don't find the paperwork to be difficult. Um, Northeast Oregon Housing really kind of does it for you and sends you a packet with a bunch of little stickies telling you where you have to sign. <laughs> so it's not it's not difficult for us. But we try, we you know we've got people who've been there for a long time who aren't on assistance. So you know it just depends on who's there to rent when an apartment comes up. But just to clarify Northeast Oregon so that is high money. That's my understanding. Okay. But yeah they have the the, the renters have their relationship with HUD. If and then HUD that. sends me the rent. And then they have to follow our rules. So. Sure. I just have a question. And this is not a question. So. Louder, sir. Um, I think that there are also, there's also the possibility of using your HUD subsidy to purchase a home if the mortgage payment is affordable at the amount that you get. Huh. So you're correct. That is a, a HUD question. Huh. And yes, there are that. You have to be on it for so long, and you have to invest so many dollars, and um, it's a great program, but unless you have a stable, livable wage, how do you really, um, there is that option there. But making it work isn't quite the same. So how many of the people that you deal with have year-around employment, and how many of the people are 
seasonally employed. Is that is that a big cutting point there? I would say less than half is year round. And especially this winter, as all of you know, the heating costs. Yeah. Um, when you're on a fixed um, income, to be able to pay the heating bill, um, because a lot of it's electric-based or heating, it's, um, it's really not affordable. But you you run then the heating subsidy program too. Right. So is that it never is there a separate program for seniors there? Um, not really, but what we do is anyone who is senior or on social security disability, um, we process all of those applications first. Because we only get so many dollars. So really the focus is to support those and I I've been doing that program as well for six years, and it's rare that um, we aren't able to help everyone that comes in. Um, there's a couple different programs that I can pull from. We also get private donations for some of those folks that are kind of on the edge of, you know, they're just barely over income okay. to qualify, but um, due to medical costs or emergency reasons, they really just and that a misconception is that the, the heating program is a one-time payment. It's not every month. And does that payment cover more than one month, or generally just one month? Just depends on um, household size and income. Income. Um, typically. It's anywhere between $125 to $550. Okay. And it's just a lump sum amount. Um, it's a lump sum amount that goes directly to the vendor. And then the vendor pulls off of that until the credit is gone. And that heating assistance can go towards power. It can go towards propane or oil. It can go towards wood. Um, program but are, are, <clears throat> are we getting more of these people coming into the county or are these people that fall under this are they older residents been in the county for quite some time and just uh, fall into this as you know they get older and they on fixed income or are, I guess I'm just we have a problem, but people are, are people coming into the county that are coming in that aren't skilled, don't have jobs, and don't have any money, and so they're looking for help. I think it's difficult to put it in a nutshell like that, just to put it all in one group. Um, I notice it just depends on the time of the year. In the summertime, we have a few more transients um, that come through, and you know, are just trying to see what resources because we have employers we've got jobs out there now. so the people the people at entry level jobs are having to bunch together to afford market rate apartments that's a real common occurrence there. and really one thing that i noticed you know the entry level positions are a great starting point and a great platform for you know folks to become self-sufficient but it's really not you know if, if they are an entry level position, they still put them over income for any of the support that they have. Um, so even though they're, they, they feel self sufficient and good about that, they're losing their 
stamp dollars. They're losing that housing subsidy. Um, and so they're really starting back at zero. And then do you, just as a follow-up, follow do you, are those, um, the amounts of those subsidies are going to be what they actually make in their wages? So it's actually, they actually go backwards if they take a job to be able to afford. Well, there's also the issue of, I mean, particularly this cultural workforce housing. So it's, that's a category of housing where you don't qualify for subsidies, but you have a job, you know, you just can't make it. There's just not housing available in the next year to move in. And that doesn't just, it's not just somebody who can enter into that position, but there are people like teachers and policemen and, um, you know, jobs that affect community really need. No, I don't have numbers, but I know CNAs are also in that group. They're well certified for CNAs. CNAs don't make the kind of money that some of those other people do. Yeah. And I think Andy McKee is the one who's trying to raise up. His rents are quite a bit higher than the EM&M &M building, for example. But um, I've had a few people call me who have gone to him and like, if I had something, it might have been 500. But his is eight or nine or a thousand. So, but they can do it. So we, I just talked to a, a chiropractor who's meeting here. So, um, but the, the the problem is, like you say, Susan, we try and stay at workforce housing. You know, we're not trying to be in the key, but we're just, you know, we're also have apartments. Nobody's moving out, and so it's. But both categories can have trouble finding housing. Yeah. And people, yeah. even families with uh, two incomes, uh, families with kids, you know, a lot of these people who are moving back and have uh, uh, work that they can do even um, online, they don't need to find a job here, and they can't find the house. They can't buy a house. They can't find a place to rent. I was talking to a, a man who, you know, never could find a place to rent, and he probably could have afforded, you know, something uh, that was somewhere between um, you know, what we have and what Andy McKeer, because I think he's the only one right now who has that kind of housing, which is um, a little more upscale, you know, he's redone them completely and they're really nice. And, you know, he is looking for the nurses and the doctors and the, the people, you know, the realtors or whoever, people who make a little more money. But um, we still are really lacking in just numbers of, of units. Yes, definitely. So what is the accepted? You know, it used to be that no, you, you should spend a quarter of your income. And I know what I've been reading now, some people are having to spend, is it a third? Okay, if you look at the cost of housing statistics, it's a third. Is what we're spending that's now? What's, that's the threshold. And that's, if you're paying more than a third, you're considered to be cost burdened. Um, there are a lot of costs. There are a lot of costs. You can look those statistics up, they're part of the same. So let's figure it out. At ten bucks an hour, you're making sixteen hundred bucks a month. You're you're uh, you're you're netting what thirteen fifty fourteen hundred. So that means you could spend four hundred on housing. So there's not well, much housing. Well, that includes rent plus utilities. Yeah, if you're going to pay. Oh, rent plus yeah. Plus minus three, bank card, cloth reserve. Yeah. 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 And also, I mean, at that wage, a lot of those people aren't working your own. That's right. Yeah. So then they're co collecting a partial on unemployment in the winter. That is also what HUD bases their, their um, percentage on. They base their percentage on the rent of those And, and a lot of the people that I see, you know, even though they are, they, they may be a two-person household, um, there's child support coming out of their check. Um, and or daycare. Or daycare. And daycare is lacking as well. Yeah. So just, so what, um, if that, that entry-level person you're talking about, Susan, do you have numbers on that. What's an entry level person? What are we talking about? Yeah, it depends monthly what monthly income. 
It depends where you are in Eastern Oregon. Every community in Missouri is having this issue, and several communities have done a comprehensive assessment, or sorry, not but housing assessments, and they're going to be doing valuable data in doing that for the solutions. I don't know if you were getting that done. But um, it's really hard to get to get on the panel. But is, you know, like Janet, you're housing there, do you, are, are you meeting the demand or is there much more demand do you think? For oh, I'm definitely not meeting the demand. I, I, could, I have like six people on a waiting list right now and lots of other people who have called in the last three or four months. It definitely got, I got a, started to get a lot of calls in this race. So we're talking sure, about the five, I, five six hundred dollar range? Well, yeah. Five, six, seven, around in there. Five, six, seven. But I mean, there's a lot of one bedrooms that are like four fifty or five hundred. But we're below. We're below really what even yeah. what HUD'll pay. We're below what HUD'll pay. Okay. So, you know, we're. And you we're include water, thinking. but you don't include heat, right? Uh, correct. We don't include power, right? And then also the other thing to to think about is if a family with three children what units are there? There's like, I think, I can't say the exact number, but units that have an affordable subsidized apartment um, with three or four bedrooms is non-existent. Non yeah. And so if, if even if the family's like, okay, well, we'll just cross together, then that will not be approved mm -hmm. either because it's subsidized over crowding. And so then you find a house where none of the utilities are included. Right. And then that is over the fair market value of what um, they consider would be affordable for what they can pay because they have guidelines. You know, one bedroom is the, the rent cannot exceed this amount, two bedrooms, and so on and so forth. Yes, I'm in um, Cottonwood here in Joseph, and it's subsidized, but I don't believe through HUD, and Correct. it's income related. And I was told recently, there are 14 units there, and I was told recently that there's like a two-year waiting list. And uh, Virginia, if you want to speak to what your situation is. Uh, I live at Pineview, and there are some family units there. And it's another Viridian place managed by the same people that uh, manage Cottonwood. And uh, there are some families in there with uh, four, and one I think with five little children in two bedroom apartments. And uh, they're just not available. There's places not available. And how many units do you think there are? I think there's maybe 22 there. And I'm not sure what the waiting list is. I, someone told me it was two years, but I'm not sure. I haven't checked on that. I had to wait a year and a half. But this has changed in the last couple of years. When I first started managing this building eight years ago, I had vacancies. Yeah. I had vacancies often. And you know, people would I'd get one or two inquiries and people would take it or not, but they, they could afford to be choosy, you know, five years ago. Because they had more options? Well, I assume there were more options. There must have been more availabilities. Uh -huh. Yeah, because I don't think, I mean, the, the question of, oh, is it people moving here? What, you know, what's creating the demand? And I think part of it was there did used to be more options. There were <coughs> more rentals, the rentals were more affordable. And it was now there's, yeah, there's just the affordable stuff. Well, it seems like there's more people buying that might not live there full time, and it seems like there's more Airbnbs, and you know those kind of things have to be factored in too in our you know, limited numbers. And you know, I just talked to a gal today who's trying to sell her house, and she she could easily rent it. All her inquiries are, are actually for rentals, 
and she just doesn't want to mess with it. And that's, that's the kind of numbers that have a assessment. Well, there, there's another factor here, and that's that, that um, you, I've only seen anecdotal stories about it, but there is a new back to the land movement all tied up with local whore food and all kinds of other things. Your, your crew, okay? Yep. So, <laughs> and I'll tell you anecdotally, Willie from the ski run, 20 years ago we didn't have any 20-somethings out there, right? Or very, very few. And now we've got 20-somethings with kids sometimes that are there. And those people are working at the hospital, in the foundries, um, in the breweries. Construction. In construction, okay. Are people in your coterie are, are cohort? Are, are you bunching up and sharing apartments and sharing houses? Is that how you're coping? Yeah. Um, so I car camp in the summer just because it's easier. I don't mind it. And then when the seasons turn, I'll find housing. It's easier in the winter. It definitely is. So I don't even bother in the summer. Um, and then buddies, yeah. Uh, two people uh, to a room and kind of like asking your landlord do you have an extra roommate that's thinking to win? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So. That's another problem in rent and doubling up is that mm -hmm. landlord will charge you for the extra people. So you uh -huh. might find a place for $800 a month and say, okay, we can split this between two people, but the landlord will up the rent if you have that second person. Uh -huh. I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a major concern, is, or a major thing to think about is um, greed. You know, we live in a world where everything's really expensive, and more so in this, in, it seems, in this area. And and yeah, I think. We just need to understand that we're all on this planet together and we all need each other independently, to, you know, interdependently to survive. And, and, and it's important to have to. Well, it's not necessarily greed because people need to, if you're an investor or anything else, even if you're not an investor, you just want to supply some housing for somebody, you have to make a certain return on it. Yeah. So you look at what property costs, what it costs to build a house, $125, $150 a square foot. Put it all together, you're going to have $180,000, 200000 into a cheap house. And you're going to have to get your $1,500, $1,600 a month rent out of it. That's just numbers. So that's not being greedy. No, no, I'm not saying in every case that this scenario. But, but that is, that, that came out clearly in our first meeting. The, the cost of land, the cost of lots, the cost of building, make it impossible to build houses that can rent at a reasonable rate. Okay. It's impossible. Okay. Well, it does. It does open another um, thing. It's, so many people want to live in a house. They want to buy a house, and you know most of the world lives in apartments and multi-family kinds of configuration. Whether it's a growth product, which can be built more units per land, or you know, it's or not a high rise, but you know, stacked kind of things. And um, I mean, it requires an attitude shift. But that housing can be built uh, for less because you're maximizing the density of the land. And I mean, I don't know how it's open, so I can really accommodate that. But um, you know, I mean, that's another. That's another feature. Duplexes like and fourplexes would are yeah. cheaper to build and yeah. it's kind of the cross between Yeah, you can put a fourplex on say three lots or even two lots. Uh, and you know, is, you can't. Well, I mean you could if you yeah. know the rest of the world does it, but yeah. um, it's right. not allowed here for you know a variety of reasons. So I mean there's this this other leap. To, that has to be made, right. could be made to, you know, accommodate um, denser housing, you know, different style of housing. So, uh, My conversation with the city and the county, they are not really interested in putting forth the effort to do a housing study. 
To do what? The what the comprehensive housing assessment. Yeah, assessment. I mean, they you have to find money and takes manpower. Well, I wonder if they changed their mind if someone came to them with a good reason why, like if it were done, then there would be monies available, loans available, whatever, to build, say, another apartment building in downtown Enterprise. Does it have to be the city or the county that does it? Mm -hmm. The zoning has to be changed. You can't right, put it no, to do the study. To do the study. Okay. The, the, st the study can identify the barriers. And if Northeast Oregon Development could do the study. Yeah. In fact, I think you guys did the last study. I think we'll have a resource. <laughs> it was probably the Northeast Oregon Authority. Okay. Yeah. I know that I sit on the board of Northeast Oregon exactly this sort of thing and in particular he's developed um, retirement residential facilities trailers um, looked into small houses and he said in a town that has less than 30,000 people it doesn't pencil out for him you so, guys know their market very well yeah. um, because I remember because uh, I worked with the city of Hilton for about six years they actually have this huge housing conference um, next week, but they've done a housing assessment and an update. Um, and um, as part of that, I talked to a lot of people, folks who, Chris Lins, who developed low income housing and who their particular interest in market rate housing. And you know, you talk to these guys, and they know exactly, they have five or six questions, and if you can answer those to their satisfaction, then they might be interested. But one thing that's happened with the low income housing, like um, Chris Hunts have been building, is that really depends on tax credits. Mm -hmm. uh, and the current administration has just slashed the burden of that kind of thing. So, um, you know, those are kind of, uh, there's much more competition for what's available. <coughs> so, you know, I think that there'll be a limited, a more limited number of those kind of projects, um, at least to sure. And they take a long time to the financing on that. But we're working on all the panels and, uh, you know, probably the soonest that would happen in four years ish. So, Ralph, do you know how many? So, what would you have to build a fourplex on commercial zoning? I think that's the case in Enterprise for sure. You know, but, and there is, I don't know how much there is now available for apartments, but there, I mean, the, there was a bunch of it down by the hospital, but now the mental health building is going to take up a lot of that. So that's gone. Okay. So if it's if it's not, if it's some multi-family, is that just is that just duplexes? Is it different from multi-family to or fourplex? I would. I don't. I'm not sure, but I think probably fourplex would work. Probably an apartment house wouldn't. Kathleen, do you know what the difference? No, I just know that from talking to you, from talking with the city, that um, you have to have a lot. Even if you build a duplex, you have to have two lots. You have to have two lots for yeah, a duplex. Yeah, to build a duplex. How, how many do you have to have for a four lots? Probably four, but I'm just guessing. That, so that's, that would have to be zoned differently. You would have to have some zoning changes. It seems like they would, yeah. You'd Should be far be better off looking at Malala, where the original mm -hmm. lot size was half that, and where they're pretty much motivated to look at potential zoning changes. The trouble with below is if the jobs are enterprise, then it's a drive. you've added to the burden. Yeah, we've got 13 jobs out of them. Yeah. They, they're looking for workers in Malau. Yeah. 
Well, no, it's to keep their jobs in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah. But um, I know in um, Grand, in some way in Pendleton, a lot of the older lots were zoned R2, which allowed, uh, you know, two dwellings, um, and a lot of the newer areas were zoned um, to start one. But, um, you know, large cities, Portland, for example, has, um, because of the urban growth boundary issues, I mean, they're just having to have more and more people. And they're allowing a but second. They're allowing assessment dwelling units, which yeah. would yeah. be a great solution for here because our lots are fairly right. large. You can put the second smaller unit, house. and it's ideal to rent to one person or a couple. Um, uh, you know, and sometimes it can be on the top of a garage or it can be separate. Often it's a garage renovation. But those kinds of things are really pretty innovative, and if you understand the size of housing you need, then there is some predictability in, you know, okay, if I build this, then I know, you know, there on average are 40 people looking for this kind of housing, and they, on average, can pay this. And our concern is, again, zoning. Yeah, well, it's part of the process. It's an early, it's an early thing again. We also have to bear in mind the capacity of our public um, jurisdiction. So while there may be some innovative solutions, whether it's accessory dwelling units or other types of zoning, if I know in, in the case of Portland with the accessory dwelling units, you can't build an accessory dwelling unit and then rent it out for like Airbnb or yeah. something like that. And so that requires a, a, the capacity to know what's going on and to verify that that's what's happening. And we have very limited capacity in our jurisdiction. So I think that's another factor in, in looking at what kind of potential solutions we can provide. So I'm going to the little Portland uh, tiny house yeah. workshop. The tiny house of it. It's September 9, 10, and 11. They're calling it a tiny house. Okay. You know, they've got all kinds of housing. Yeah. So, and the first afternoon is spent on finances and where the money comes from and what kind of funding there is. And then the second two days are spent on looking at various situations around Portland. And I think that there's a still a built place out by uh, John's Landing. There was a huge parking lot out there. That There's a new one in John's Landing, I think. Yeah. The, the, the city or the county or whatever, they said you could build tiny houses on this where you want. Um, but that was just a building, not a, a living. In, in most cases, you can't go on the lot. I've got a question for you. For you. I'm sorry. Uh, did you mention something about you knew what was going on in Pendleton? I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Uh, Susan Betty Jones, I'm the Eastern Army Outreach Manager. I'd heard that Pendleton had something going on with tiny homes, that they were in the process of. They were looking at the, um, so is this, uh, at the zoning, at the, yeah, they were looking at that whole thing as part of their housing issue. Um, there is, I mean, there is another piece of housing, I mean, of course, they have land, but um, there is the manufacturing home. Mm -hmm. um, those have come a long ways. They actually are through some of the Energy Star designation. And, um, and those units are, I just know, for manufacturing and conference. And, you know, they're talking about yeah. single wide starting about 50,000 and double wide's about 80. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, a lot of people don't like that sort of housing. Uh, but it's, you know, it's not well, and Nils said to leave early, but he is following the, what do you call it, the? Cross-laminated Pardon? CLT. C CLT, which stands for cross-laminated timbers. Cross which is a construction. Yeah, it's a different construction. It's cheaper construction. And they make not only the timbers, but they can actually make walls, right? This is, it's just a structural. It's a, it's just for, it's like using big timbers. But he, on the video, there are some, also some wall panels that are made out of this material. So you can put things up more cheaply and uh, more quickly, right? Well, there's a, it's interesting on that because it comes, if they're using the whole wall system, it comes and you can assemble it quickly. You pay more for the materials. So, you know, it's sort of a, which you want, where do you want your money to go? Do you want it to go into a local jobs and labor or do you want it to go out of the area where these prefab materials and put a house up in three weeks? So. 
Of course, it's amazing. It's amazing to start it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's what. But uh, we we talked about it last week, and we will do something on small houses. But you guys are doing a workshop right now in timber framing, right? Right this moment, actually. Right. If you go down. Yeah. So go by and look at that. And I know you've talked to Zacharias too about what he's doing, and so we'll try to do one on that. I think that a couple things occur to me here. Uh, with that, number one, Sarah, can you guys look at housing survey possibilities? Yeah. With that, <laughs> well, you were talking, but I said, okay, Lisa. I mean, just think about it. I don't want to put you on the spot, but it seems that one of the pieces that might be missing here is survey. Okay. Yeah. And Aunt Virginia's had her hand up. I'm, oh. I'm taller, oh, so. <laughs> Uh, just a, a thought here, um, no real solution, but a thought. I've heard a lot of comments about zoning and zoning hit this and that being a problem. I used to be a planning and zoning coordinator in Idaho, one of the counties there for a while. And um, we had the best results in approving zoning and changing it when the builder had the dream, had the idea for what he wanted came in with a set of plans, and we could take that to the Planning and Zoning Commission, to the Board of Commissioners, and if it had to go further than that, we did the same thing. And they were willing to listen. It was not a matter of, we've just never done this before. They said, well, if people are out here coming in and this is a common thing, maybe we need to listen. And they did, they listened, and I think, don't be afraid of your commissioners or your Planning and Zoning people. They're elected officials. Mostly. I would say the county's planning department said the same thing. Okay. They said they couldn't say what they do in a, in a abstract. Abstract, abstract. Yeah. yeah. You just do come you, do with you have the stuff. The property in mind? Do you have a builder that's already working on this? Yeah. Then we take a look at it. Bring in the plans, we approve the plans, and take it from there. The, the, the only other thing that occurs to me that could be attacked without money and more, or without much money, maybe, immediately, is some kind of exchange on on this whole uh, uh, shared housing thing. That what's being done now is all informal, right? Yeah. You know somebody, and if they and, and sometimes the landlord raises the rent, and sometimes it doesn't, whatever. But if there was some place where people in need of housing could go, and they know they can't afford more than four hundred dollars a month for instance, or $500 a month, if there was some one place that person could go and say, I'm looking for shared housing, and I can pay 500 it seems like that might be I think a, we have that with Willow Valley Reclassified, yeah. Facebook, etc. You think so? I mean, oh, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, it, takes time. Yeah. it still takes time. But, no. but I mean, that's part of the, the beauty of it, is that you kind of have to integrate more into the right. have those connections. So and there's always the book club right. right. bulletin board. Right. The book club bulletin board. It's still there. Yeah. It's reasonable. Uh, right. And the other thing is that the, the employers, uh, you know, talking to David Smith down there, it would be interesting to get more information from employers about about their problems with uh, with hiring and retaining help and how that relates to housing. So I don't, you know, I think that we can informally. As we know, employers ask those questions. Because they don't want to respond to me. They don't want to respond to me because they don't want to go on a record as saying they don't have housing and jobs that are good. Uh -huh. But that is part of what you, that is yeah. one of the, but that is, we know, we gather we information from, from for us. Oh, I have that question for Jeanette. Back to the folks that you see that come in, I know one of the Funding sources that's available is for self-help housing for people that want to put in sweat equity to, to create housing. I'm not no acronyms. I don't know the acronyms. But I'm wondering if the folks that you see are in a position, in your opinion, to both work on a house and to be able to afford some sort of payment if it was a house. 
That's a great question, and in my opinion, the, the folks that I see are not in the position to do that. They're in the position they have, if they get their bills paid, they maybe have $10. And why are they going to, you know? I did, by the way, contact Habitat for Humanity yeah, in the grant. And you know how many houses they built in a year? One. One. And that's in La Grande. That's in Union County. So they do do, they have a repair program and they work on 35 to 45 houses a year for upgrading houses. So I think there's a need there and that's a, another, uh, they especially work on senior citizen houses and that kind of thing. But there is, uh, you know, other parts of the state, Habitat for Humanity is going to gangbusters and often it, it requires that there be a parcel of land if you can be building six houses at the same time uh, and you, you know the instruction and the supervision suddenly becomes far more manageable for for habitat and um, and people can trade work back and forth you know of the, it becomes a work so this house for a while but at this point when they can move on and all the hours now up and that sort of thing and just it gets uh, you know way easier so Given, I mean, this is a pretty make it happen yourself kind of environment um, that I've always thought that was a real opportunity. It's a real fit for kind of the agrarian, you know, type folks who, um, you know, I mean, want to want to physically be part of making. Well, and one of the things that was mentioned last time was the, 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 the land trust idea, where the land trust owns the land and then you build on it, and you know, that's another thing to explore. Has anyone really looked at uh, like salvaging a lot of the deadwood like from the National Forest Land or looking at straw bale houses like in terms of, I know that gets right exit, uh, but like, has that been thrown out as an option? I, I didn't get that. So say that loud. Uh, has anyone looked at straw bale construction or just all the dead? Because well, you look at Mount Howard, and there's tons of wood up there. Uh, and I, I know some of my forest buddies are like, yeah, it's just waiting to burn. Like, well, if you can do two things at once and harvest some of that and use it for a lot of this construction. Uh, I looked into straw construction, and it's actually a little more expensive mm -hmm. than the stick built house. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's great, but it does need a certain kind of maintenance level that a conventional home doesn't, and you know, the person who builds it can understand it. And, you know, make it look like a charm, and somebody comes kind of who's in who doesn't understand that, who doesn't have that level of commitment, yeah. then it starts to get problematic, which is why it's so, not. I think between I think between uh, uh, Greg and Ashley and, and uh, this interest in smaller houses and, and Mills being positioned to work with that and David Schmitz down in Wallowa and his uh, making use of of, uh, of Forest Service material that there are some real efforts. I mean that's a good direction to go and and I think that we can do. Uh, Something there. It does seem, you know, one of the holes is planning and, and zoning. Right. I've been, I've been looking at tiny, tiny houses and buildings for about eight years. And the issue is always so where to put it. Uh -huh. Where to be able to put it. Uh -huh. So that's always the issue. I can build it. Yeah. Where do I put it? Where do you, yeah. yeah. On the salvage piece, too, um, you know, if you're talking round wood, it's different than if you're talking mill lumber because if it's mill lumber, it probably has to be traded in order to use it as you know, construction. But again, to speak to Virginia's earlier point, I think if you get builders that are interested in it, mm -hmm. then they're going to handle that end of things. The, the, the potential homeowner doesn't have to. If you're going to build timber framing, you're going to go through the exercise of legalities and stuff to help people with that, right? And if, if Zachary, yeah. So I don't think that, no, I think that's probably handled at that end, so to certain extent. Virginia? Uh, we were one of the first counties in, in the area there to approve yurts. No. 
And uh, I have come to find out here recently that they're using those a lot for small housing, for campgrounds, for one family, two families, and they're very roomy, very easy to keep warm. The uh, plans and what we learned from that absolutely amazed everybody. They said, we all want one. <laughs> where to put it? Pardon? Where to put it? Well, right. That's the issue. The land. Mm -hmm. yeah, Some builder would have to be, say, I, I can try this. Maybe I can get more money out of building these than I can out of a brick stone house. I, I don't know. Well, it's, it's about 1 o'clock. A couple of things I think if people have, uh, I'm, I'm willing to foster uh, more conversations here and host them. And I know we're going to do one on small houses. Um, but you guys might have other, in, and some of the things we didn't talk about, senior housing specifically, is that a topic that we should address specifically? Oh, absolutely. I've had I have a couple approach me about senior housing and, and how they might be able to, you know, move out of their very nice home now, but into something that's more, um, that's smaller, easier to take care of. And I mean, talk to Steve Zolman about the possibility of putting some little cabins out there. And that, which were in his original plans, which he still has, uh -huh. behind Alpine House. Yeah, okay. 55 plus housing is really, really yeah. big um, land there. So does that agree that we should do one on senior housing then yeah, at some point? And that's another question we'll allow. Well, I've got two of those not tiny houses, but cottages. They're really happy with. And we'll allow, not we'll allow a county, we'll allow a city. And we'll allow a city also zoning is friendly for small houses because although you have to have a thousand square feet on a lot, you can put, and what a lot of people have done there, you can have a single white trailer and make up a thousand feet with a porch. Okay. <laughs> How cool. Yeah. Yeah, Let's start up an issue that's been concerning me is it sounds like in Wallawa the city government's involved in here and in Enterprise. I don't think they are involved, and I think it's really imperative to get them involved so they can be part of solving this puzzle. And that's up to the citizens then to do. There's an opening out here. Yep. I'm sorry? There's an opening in the Malawi City Council, I hear. Oh, yeah. Is there? yeah, and that was for their, their firebrand, their leader in the Wallawa revitalization. Garrett Lowe had to resign for health issues. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Um, I, I, something lingering for me is. Is is this uh, that we have to, is this this whole price issue? I think we touched on it here, but I think that's something to think about. Is is what can people afford, and how do we make the housing for that? We need to find a builder who's going to lose money. Have to. <laughs> 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 Well, when I came here 46 years ago, I, 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 I ran the employment office. And I always said that when people complained about unemployment, I said unemployment is a subsidy program for you guys that need labor four months a year. So I think that that, you know, that, that, that a lot of these programs, it, it's very difficult to work seasonally and afford decent housing. Yeah, I mean, the office yeah. is in the grand. And by the time you started to, when you receive it, it's like, what, well, a month, two months? So by then, you're so far behind, and you're not, just, it creates a whole new ball of access. Any other issues? Please, you can email me at rich at fishtrap.org. And uh, I thank you all for coming. Yeah. Thank you.